by the middle of the year, the Red Keep, King's Landing and King Aegon III were all firmly in the grasp of the new hand on Wimpeak. The small folk were quiet and content. The winter fever receded, Queen Jehera hid in seclusion in her chambers, King Aegon trained in the yard by morning and stared at the stars by night. Beyond the walls of King's Landing, however, the woes that had afflicted the realm these past two years had only worsened. The trade had withered away to nothing. War continued in the west. Famine and fever ruled much of the north. The Dornishmen were growing bolder and more troublesome. It was past time the Iron Throne showed its power, Lord Peak decided. The construction had been completed on eight of the ten great warships commissioned by Sir Tylan Lannister, so the Hand resolved to begin by opening the narrow sea to trade once more. To command the royal fleet, he tapped another uncle, Sir Gedman Peak, a seasoned battler known as Gedman Great Axe, for his favourite weapon. Though justly renowned for his prowess as a warrior, Sir Gedmund had little knowledge or experience of ships, however. So his lordship also summoned the notorious sail cell, Ned Bean, called Black Bean, for his thick black beard, to serve as Great Axe's second in command and advise him on all matters nautical. The situation in the Stepstones, as Gedmund and Black Bean set sail, was chaotic, to say the least. When Calio Rydoon's ships had been swept from the sea for the most part, but he still ruled Bloodstone, largest of the islands and a few small rocks in between. The Tyroshi had been on the point of overwhelming him when Lisa Mir had made peace and launched a joint attack on Tyrosh, forcing the Archon to recall his ships and swords. The three-headed alliance of Bravos, Pentos and Lorath had lost one of its heads with the withdrawal of the Lorathi, but the Pentoshi Sal swords held all of the stepstones not in the hands of Rencalio's men, and the Bravosi warships owned the waters in between them. Westeros could not hope to prevail in a sea war against Bravos. Lord Unwin knew this. His purpose, he declared, was to put an end to the rogue Rancalio Rydoon and his pirate kingdom and establish presence upon Bloodstone to ensure that never again could the narrow sea be closed. The royal fleet comprised eight new warships and some twenty older cogs and galleys and was nowhere large enough to hope to accomplish this. So the hand wrote to Driftmark, instructing the Lord of the Tides to gather his grandsire's fleets and put them under the command of Gedmund, so that he may open the sea roads once again. This was no more than Alan Valarian had long desired, as the sea snake Corlys Valarian had before him, though when he read the message, the young Lord bristled and declared, They are my fleets now, and Baylor's monkey is more suited to command them than Gedmund. Even so, he did as he was bid, bringing together 60 war galleys, 30 longships, and more than 100 cogs to meet the royal fleet as it swept out from King's Landing. As the great war fleet passed through the gullet, Sir Gedman sent over Blackbean to Lord Allen's flagship, Queen Rainies, with a letter authorising him to take command of the Valarian squadrons, so they might benefit from his years of experience. Lord Allen sent him back. I would have hanged him, he wrote to Sir Gedmund, but I am loath to waste good rope. In winter, strong northern winds often prevail upon the narrow sea, so the fleet made splendid time on this voyage south. Off Tarth, another dozen longships rode out further to swell their ranks, commanded by Lord Brydemere, the Evenstar. The tidings that his lordship brought, however, proved less welcoming. The Sea Lord of Bravos, the Archon of Tyrosh, and Rancalio Rydune had made common cause. They would rule the Stepstones jointly, and only such ships as they licensed to trade by Bravos or Tyrosh would be allowed to pass. What of Pentos? Lord Allen wanted to know. Disregarded, the Evenstar informed him. A pie split three ways offers larger slices than one cut into quarters. Gedman Greatax, who had been so seasick during the voyage that the sailors had named him Gedman Greensick, decided that the king's hand should be informed of this new alignment among the warring cities. The even star had already sent a raven to King's Landing, so Pink decreed that the fleet would remain at Tarth until a reply was received. That will lose us any hope of taking Rancalio by surprise, argued Alan Valarian, but Sir Gedmund proved adamant. The two commanders parted angrily. The next day, the sun rose. Black Bean woke Sir Gedmund to inform him that the Lord of the Tides was gone. The entire Valorian fleet had slipped off during the night. Gedmund snorted. Run back to Driftmark, I'd venture, he said. Black Bean agreed, calling Alan a scared boy. They could not have been more wrong. Lord Alan had taken his ship south, not north. 
Three days later, whilst Gedman the Great Axe and his royal fleet still lingered off the coast of Tarth, waiting on a raven, battle was joined amongst the rocks, sea and stacks, and tangled waterways of the stepstones. The attack caught the Provosi unawares, with their Grand Admiral and two score of his captains feasting on bloodstone with Rancalier Rydoon and the envoys from Tyrosh. Half the Provosi ships were taken, burned or sunk, while still at anchor. Others, as they raised sail to try and get away. The fight was not entirely bloodless. The Grand Defiance, a towering Brovosi warship of 400 oars, fought her way past half a dozen smaller Valarian warships to gain the open sea, only to find Lord Allen himself bearing down on her. Too late, the Brovosi tried to turn to face her, but the huge warship was ponderous in the waters and slow to answer, and Queen Rainey struck her broadside with every oar churning the water. The Queen's prow smashed into the side of the great Brovosi ship like a great oaken fist, one observer wrote later, splintering her oars, crushing through her planks and hull, cutting the massive warship almost in two. When Lord Allen shouted to his rowers to back off, the sea rushed into the gaping wound the Queen had made, and the defiance went down in a mere moment, and with it, the sea lord's swollen pride. Allen Valorian's victory was complete. He lost three ships in the Stepstones. One, sadly, was Trueheart, captained by his cousin, Daron, who perished when she sank, while sinking more than 30 and capturing 6 galleys, 11 cogs, 89 hostages, vast amounts of food, drinks, arms and coin, and an elephant meant for the Sea Lord's menagerie. All this, the Lord of the Tides brought back to Westeros, along with the name that he would carry for the rest of his long life, Oakenfist. Fist. <laughs>